Welcome back to Silent Fire, a podcast. Uh, I am Colin Nicole. And I am Joshua Hoffert. And we're here today to talk a little bit about prayer and God, liturgical and repetitious, or spontaneous and free. Uh, we were talking before this episode started, and uh, Josh had a story to, uh, to relay to us, to tell us about uh, from the time of the Desert Fathers. Yes, um, it, it, the, the liturgical and repetitious or spontaneous and free. Um, I'll tell the story and then we'll, yeah, obviously yeah. we'll talk about then it. Then we'll yeah. fight. Then we'll fight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Who has bigger muscles? Yeah. yeah right, you can do right. some, some push ups in the background while I, okay. uh, yeah. <laughs> Pretty um, impressive. Uh, yeah. So in the, in the desert fathers, I was thinking, as we were talking about, I was, I was thinking about this story. Um, and I can't remember what father it was, but basically, um, he, his father's caught up into um, what they called an ecstasy, a trance. Is the, it's the same word in um, Greek, trance and ecstasy, the same words. And so he's caught up into this experience, and uh, when he comes out of this experience, one of his disciples notices that something's going on with his father. Mm. And so he comes out of the experience, and the, father go, and the disciple goes to the father, Father, where were you? What happened? And the father says... Like he's like, no, no, I don't want to talk about it, which was common. They're, they they didn't actually want to divulge right. those types of things. And uh, he had to press him a number of different times. No, tell me where you were. Tell me where you were. Tell me what happened. And the disciple, or the father, finally says to the disciple, um, I, was, I was at the cross of Christ mm. watching Mary weep, wow. and I wish I could weep that way. Mm. And such a, I mean, such a profound, impactful moment for this particular father. Yeah. Um, and so much so that he didn't, he, he didn't want to share it at all. It was just too, you know, sometimes those, those moments you have before the Lord that just become so precious. Sure. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. And, but he didn't want to share it at all. And one of the things, um, it's like to me in, in the background, in the charismatic background that I came from is a story like that. Um, it ends up, it ends up being looked at as almost the height of, the spiritual life. Right. And then, and then I've, I've noticed people that weigh themselves or their level of importance or gifting or calling or anything like that based on if they've had an experience like that. And so that, that's to me, that's kind of emblematic of spontaneous and free, you know, it just mm -hmm. kind of happens mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so that, that, that particular, uh, the story is obviously beautiful and it obviously happened. Um, it's nothing about that, but, is that the thing that we weigh our spiritual life against? Right. Or is there, is there a better metric when it comes to prayer, when it comes to knowing God, when it comes to experiencing the life of God in, in times of prayer? Yeah. And so I know in my, in my background, in that, in that charismatic type of, ex, or even Pentecostal type of expression, now I had said to you earlier that there's a podcast I've been listening to um, by a guy named Ryan Reeves. And he characterized the Pentecostal charismatic movement mm -hmm. as, with the term emotionalism. Right. And that, that is a fair critique or a fair, fair, it's not even a critique, it's a fair label. Mm -hmm. But I also wanted to say to him, but not all of us are like that. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> sure. Right. <laughs> but that's kind of the, this, the belief about prayer is it should be hyper emotional. Right. And, right. and it should drive you to tears and it, or it should drive you to some exuberant experience. Mm -hmm. And, I, I'm not saying that prayer is not like that, but I, sometimes I find that problematic. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious from your perspective because the 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 we were just do we just did the um, the morning prayer this That's morning right. together, yeah. right? I helped you do the reading. Yeah. Um, I'm always struck, of course, being in an Anglican church or any liturgical church. I'm always struck by how rhythmic mm -hmm. um, the the service tends to be. Right. And and so I'm just curious from your perspective. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the thing about, uh, you know, the Anglican tradition is that there's a lot of things that, um, you know, while we have kind of ways of doing it, there's things that we also don't don't deny, experiences we don't deny. So there's people, you know, within this church, this parish that I know, you know, um, speak in tongues, you know, when they pray mm -hmm. or, or, or go for those sort of uh, ecstatic moments of, of, of encounters with God in prayer and others for whom that would be like completely and totally sure. foreign and weird. And they say, well, I don't know if that's... Right. Is our tongues real and that sort of and, thing? You know, that's funny. That and, and as much as the charismatic Pentecostal world is one of the distinguishing marks, t typically tends to be tongues, especially Pentecostals. Right. I, I I've been in lots of non-denominational charismatic churches 
where people would believe, now this would be more rare, but people would believe in prophecy, but not mm. necessarily, they'd have a problem with tongues. Right, yeah. Right? And, uh, or tongues as it's, as it's the early 1900s communicated tongues was. Sure, right? sure, yeah. Well, it, al- it always seems to be this it's, kind yeah. of, this kind of like marker or barrier that people can kind of go up to it and then once... For some people, I find yeah. you know it gets crossing kind of a bit, the chicken line. Oh, it gets a bit too weird, and they're like, "No, no, no, I can't go there." But yes. uh, and and of course, it's not you know. I mean, I mean, different gifts are given to different people, and right. I, you know, tongues may not be for for everyone to pray in. Well, but, see, that's controversial to even say that. Right. Right. In, in well, the, in yeah. the Pentecostal world, sure, sure. Um, and now, I, I'm not. I'm more on board with you, but and I know in the Pentecostal world. There's lots of people that tongues is the evidence that the Holy Spirit has come well, to. Well, sure, right? sure, and there's certainly, I mean, Pentecost and all of that. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Um, I, I'm thinking of you know talking about uh, you know to some are different given you know the yes, gift of exactly, prophecy and exactly. gift of tongues. Yeah, and that sort of Paul thing talks. Too, about, Paul says that in First Corinthians, First Corinthians, um, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14. That yeah, yeah. I, I think there's definitely room to understand it that way. Sure. Yeah. And so, and, I mean, one of the things too about the way we pray in the Anglican church and in, in the kind of tradition that we come from, uh, you know, I know that for a lot of people, um, the word, the word dead sometimes gets thrown around. I'm not, I mean, I've never had dead a, tradition, dead mean, tradition, yes, dead, you yes. know, dead prayer. You're just sort of sitting I've heard, there. Yeah, for sure. I've heard people reading say from that, a book. Yeah. It's just, there's no, there's no life. There's no spirit in it. Um, and, and I think that it's, I don't know if it's that we sort of set a different, you know, like you said, with like, what is the mark of true prayer, you know, and, and, right, and you right. know, for, for Pentecostals or most, you know, it's like, I mean, speaking in tongues is sort of like one of the metrics that you're yeah, like, okay, be, yeah, for, for sure. other people, it's like, definitely, it has to be um, uh, a bit more lively, a bit more, um, yes. you know, engaged or something like that. Uh, I think for, for us in, in this tradition, there's something to be said, and I think the fathers too, the desert fathers, yeah. I mean, for them, there's something to be said about just like, just the slow kind of chipping away every day, yes. you know, kind of bringing something out of just the rock, uh, you know, the, the habit that you right. form in prayer. Yeah, um, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I love that you said that. One of the things I remember feeling early on in, in my spiritual walk, if, if I had a time of prayer hmm. and that time of prayer wasn't marked by some significant weighty, feeling right. so to speak right? right then somehow that time of prayer was less effective <laughs> right. than the previous day or the day before that or the sure, day before sure. that right it, it the the effectiveness of the prayer this is this is this is my critique on myself mm. the way i looked at it back then the effectiveness of the prayer had to do more with me right than the right. one i was praying to right yeah and and i didn't really appreciate or understand um the seasons of deprivation that we go through in the yeah. spiritual life where yeah. we, where we really don't, where we feel like God is distant, where we don't have this sense of his, of his presence accompanying us. Yeah. I didn't have an appreciation for that. And, and it's because again, the metric for successful prayer was how did it leave me feeling? Right. And sure. Prayer can obviously leave you with a sense of peace or joy mm-hmm. or any of those things. Mm-hmm. It, it definitely can. I'm, I'm, I'm not speaking against that no, no, naturally, no. but, um, the, the, I was just thinking as you were talking about the, the form and function that you'd even see in the tabernacle in, uh, in the Old Testament. Right. And right. how, you know, the spirit led them into the wilderness, mm-hmm. but there were long seasons in that 40 year sojourn in the wilderness. The spirit would, this, this cloud that was hovering over the tabernacle that is essentially the embodiment of the spirit of God. Yeah hovering over the tabernacle would then move and they'd pack everything up. Yeah. Right. That would be spont- spontaneously move yeah. and pack everything up. And then they'd go until it stopped. Right. And then they'd rebuild the same form and structure again. Yeah. Right. And enter back into that same rhythm day in and day out of yeah. the sacrifices, the, the prayers, all this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So you had, in one sense, you had that, the, Oh no, the spirit's moving now. Mm-hmm. The cloud's moving. We got to get, we got to pack everything up and go. Yeah. But then the daily in and out is of, much the same. Is much the thing. same. Yeah. In the in the Desert Fathers in particular, um, and I, I've I've seen this in just coming into contact with the litur- liturgical stuff and and um, and looking at the Book of Common Prayer and stuff, mm-hmm. is that the, the Desert Fathers generally had some some kind of rhythm where they were praying and singing and speaking through twelve songs, twelve psalms a day. Right. That was, I think it was John Cassian that really codified that. Okay. Where here's here's these these twelve psalms, these twelve psalms, these twelve psalms, and so there was always that repetition mm-hmm. to them. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And that was a large part of their prayer life was mm -hmm. the book of Psalms. And, and those, I mean, those sorts of practices too in the, in the, in that very early church, I mean, eventually, and I'm no expert on it, but eventually became kind of codified into uh, like the seven offices of prayer a day that, right. that monastics, you know, especially when things got a bit more developed and formalized. Yeah. That monastics would be praying, and and which you know the daily services that we have in the Anglican Church, like morning prayer, we prayed this right, morning, right. is is really morning and evening prayer is a composite of the morning offices of those seven and the evening right. offices of those seven, and so you know the English reformers, uh, Cranmer in particular, who who was the architect of the prayer book, I mean saw the benefit to people's daily right. lives to to bring right. to bring this monastic kind of rhythm that has been going on well I mean since the early church since. You know, time since, exactly yeah. uh, to bring that into into lay people's yeah. lives, and even says, I mean, the beautiful thing in the Book of Common Prayer, I think, um, is there's you know throughout, as we saw this morning, there's these things called rubrics, which are like teeny tiny italicized texts. Yes, and so that's the text that tells you what to do, yes. and then the I bigger words that. are the words that. It's very you helpful say. when you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> it's helpful when you don't know what to say exactly. <laughs> oh, think there's instructions there's in a, here. It comes yeah. with instructions. It's like IKEA, yeah. Yes. Um, and so, you know, one of the things it says, if you read the rubrics before morning and evening prayers, it says, you know, the bell should always be rung so that if people can't come, they know they're being prayed for. Right. Right. And that's just such a lovely way to, to, to think about, um, to think about this rhythm of prayer that it's like, you know, it, it may not always be ecstatic. It may not always be exciting. Right. Like right. when I come here and right. I say morning and evening prayer, it's not like I always want to come here and do it. Sure. It's not like every time I do it, I'm having a great time. What a great discipline for the will. Well, ex but exactly. Yeah. Right. Is that it's just it's like I said, it's just sort of this habituation of our of our prayer and, and this rhythm into our lives so that, you know, the fathers, too, I think, um, think of the Jesus prayer. Yes. Right. And I think I think the word they use, I don't remember who who kind of coined it or called it, but like hesychastic yes, prayer. Yes, hesychastic. Meaning it means peace or stillness. Peace and stillness, and it's yeah. incorporated with the breath. And the yeah. idea is that when you when you pray this this Jesus prayer enough, and you combine it with a practice of breathing, it makes it so that when you breathe, you're praying. Yeah. It's yeah. Just ceaselessly, right? Yeah. You're breathing in and breathe. Yeah. That. By the way, for those that are watching, the Jesus prayer is the it's the statement that's it's probably the oldest. Christian prayer yeah. um, in terms of church history. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Yeah. Or some form of that. Some, you know, yeah. Sometimes it's shortened to Jesus, bit. have mercy on me. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so that's, that's the form. And the, 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 the form in terms of the words, the function was usually you're almost praying it on, praying each syllable on every breath yeah, is yeah. kind of the idea. Yeah. Um, and I mean, even getting to the Orthodox tradition, of course, they talk about Pray, I mean, there's one story in uh, the book, The Way of the Pilgrim, mm -hmm. um, which is a, it's a 19th century uh, book on prayer from the Russian Orthodox Church. Mm -hmm. And the, the story basically has the pilgrim trying to learn to pray, mm -hmm. and he en eventually ends up talking to this Orthodox monk, or pre Orthodox monk, I think. And the, the monk says, go into the woods and say the Jesus prayer 3,000 times. Right. So yeah. the guy goes into the woods, he says the Jesus prayer 3,000 times. He comes back to the monk, and... Um, and he says, I said it 3,000 times. The monk says, okay, go, great, go back and say it 6,000 times. Yeah. You know, he, so the next day he says it 6,000 times. Well, he struggles with trying to get it through. Sure. And then comes back, I did it 6,000 times. He goes, go back and say it 9,000 times, right? And it just, it's just always, it's always up. The whole yeah. point was not the, the I mean, the, the, in, the, in the kind of the, the dead sense, you know, the yes, dead tradition yeah. sense, People would take that and say, oh, "I've got to say it this many times." Yes, but the yeah. the point the monk was trying to get across is that find the practice so that the rate the prayer continues to say itself within you. Yeah, 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 yeah. And in this way, and the whole point was teaching him to find the place of unceasing prayer. Yeah. Now, now personally, to me, I, I mean, I find great value in the discipline of that. Mm -hmm. Personally, to me, I one of the things that happens in the way of the pilgrim is. The pilgrim goes forward, and he finds that everywhere he goes, he's saying, he's constantly saying it, hmm. and he's he, so his it's his heart is praying, yeah. and and there's a there's a beauty to that, but I also have hesitations with it, and I don't know if that's part of my charismatic background right. of where's the spontaneity of it, and um, but at the same time, you know, sometimes I just get crossed with those things, yeah, and, sure, and sure, trying sure. to figure out, okay, I I totally agree find that rhythm and find that practice. And um, it's a, I'll say this, the way I've come to describe unceasing prayer 
is living with the constant awareness that God is by your side. Right. Yeah. As a and and I think that carries the ethos mm-hmm. that was being communicated in that story. Right. Um, not a fictional story, but a real story. Yeah. Right? Yep. That was being communicated in that experience is he learned to live with an awareness that he was always with God and everywhere he walked, God was with him. And if that's the way he came to it, great. But the problem is if I had that conversation with that Orthodox monk, he would say, no, this is the way. Right. And, um, and I'm going, how do we have, how do we allow for Mm -hmm. variations within that? Yeah. And I don't, I don't think, you know, these things are, are in my experience, of course, mutually exclusive. Like it's like, um, I think there's, there's, uh, even though, you know, I come from a tradition where there, there is a kind of like fairly rigid form of, of, of daily prayer sure. and, and weekly prayer, you know, I mean, I think that sort of gives a shape to, to our lives. I was thinking about it this week. Um, I hope this doesn't sort of diatribe too much into Anglican. Oh, weird. I hope it does. Anglican so. weird. You hope it does. <laughs> I exactly. hope it does. Yeah. That's why so, we're here. That's so why right, I'm here. I want to know. <laughs> so right now in, in, uh, or, or just coming up next week, it, on Thursday is uh, the Feast of the Ascension, so the day that we commemorate yes. and remember Jesus' ascension into heaven. And coming, I mean, right out of the early church, the three days before that, Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, are what are called rogation days. Okay. And rogation comes from a Latin word, which just means to ask. They're asking days. And okay. it comes from, I guess, in like the, the fifth century in France, there was these natural disasters in this this area was was just stricken and and uh, and there was no no food and the spring was mm-hmm. coming up and the bishop there said look like like we need to make sure that our crops are, are good we have to have food you know through this growing season so he said what we're going to do you know as a as an area as, as a community is we're going to fast and we're going to take three days of fasting and prayer and we're going to process like walk all around our communities and we're going to bless the fields and ask God's blessing to be upon the the you know the seeds and and the earth. Right. so that we can be safe and and Sunday before that is now called rogation Sunday and 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 in contemporary times it's a time where we we specifically ask God's blessing upon the earth it's spring you know we yeah. live in PEI so this is big time farming I mean, area um, well yes. so we're finally away from cold and snow we're fi- <laughs> yeah, finally the yeah, ground is thawed Jesus. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and so and so it's 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 a Sunday that you know I'll preach about and, and we'll talk about a the importance of prayer in our right. asking um, but B, it's a way that, that, you know, when it focuses so much on the land and on the area, you know, in which we live, it's a way of kind of like claiming the land mm-hmm. for God and saying, look, like, like this is, this is a, a civic community, but yeah. this is kind of God's land. And I think, I think prayer, you know, our daily prayer and our rhythms of prayer, uh, primarily are kind of doing that with our time, right? right? Like having morning and evening prayer every day is a way of sort of saying, look, we're claiming this, this day, this right. time for God right. it, in the morning and in the evening, first and right. last, right. we're going to pray. And I think in the midst of that, you know, that sets the sort of rhythm that sets the boundary of the day right. in the midst of that is that room for, for spontaneous right. and, and good. extemporaneous prayer. Um, but I, speaking as someone who loves boundaries and like needs things kind of like right. set over me to, to, you know, fall into, fall into a rhythm. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think often human beings, we, we do need those sort of those sort of set rhythms, e- even yeah. just so that the extemporaneous and the spontaneous can can sort of there can be room made for it, I guess. Right. But yeah, I think I think that's the case. I would agree with you. I, I remember um, it was a few years ago when I realized I don't remember where where I came across it or mm. how I was taught it. I, I just can't remember the source of it. But when I realized that the the idea behind, say, a Catholic Mass, mm-hmm. um, like the Mass is going to happen whether there's people there or not. Right. The point wasn't the people being there. Right. The point was that prayers are being said for right. um, everybody, whether it's priest or laity, whether it's, you know, we, we had one, one, there's one prayer, of course, in the common book of prayer, the Anglican mm-hmm. one from today was for Queen Elizabeth. Yes. Yeah. Um, and which I said that even though I'm American. <laughs> Thank you. I noticed that. I noticed that. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, well I, I was pray for your leaders. Right? I was I was in Georgia in October, and I said yeah. the one in that in Georgia that same prayer. I think you pray for the the state and the president, and I prayed okay. for that. Okay. One yeah. So All right. Yeah. So even. you're good to, uh, <laughs> to right. adjust yeah. yourself, right? That's right. Um, uh, it's, anyway, that that the that the service itself wasn't it wasn't necessarily for the people. Right. I mean, it, yes, it is for the. It, it is in yeah. terms of 
in an evangelical church, the service largely is for preaching the word right. to the people, right? right? Yeah. So it's a, it's a fundamentally different idea when it comes to why we gather. Yeah. And, and I do think there's some big differences between those two between those two things when it comes yeah. to liturgical tradition or evangelical charismatic tradition. And um, but one, so one of the things I love about the liturgical tradition that mm-hmm. I think the charismatics that we could take from it is that form and function that says right. that says um, actually the service and the pr- and prayer is not about you. Right. So it's not. It's about God. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and God in His presence will impact you. Yeah. Just like he came into the world and he impacted everything. God in his presence will impact you. So yeah, there's going to be a heart change and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it's really not about you. No. And yeah. and that should be one of the principles of life is it's not about you. It's well, about him. And, and that's one of the one of the criticisms even from within the Anglican Church. I mean, mm-hmm. people doing morning and evening prayer every day is a, is a very rare thing for that to happen in right. churches, right? Um, and one of the criticisms I remember hearing it in seminary is, you know, when people say, well, what, what kind of things can we do in a parish to encourage spiritual life? If you said, oh, I'm going to say morning and evening prayer from the day of the Book of Common Prayer every day, the first thing that people say is, well, no one's going to show up. Right. 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 As, as if the point of our praying right. is having people show up. Of course, right. it's nice. Of course, we want people. The metric to, for success. To how many people. Exactly. Come, right? How many people can you yeah. write down in your in your log book in the vestry? Right. So. Um, yeah, that's a that's a totally real a real thing, and and, it, and it's a real danger because it kind of makes a bit of an idol out of, um, yeah. you know, out of numbers and out of out of ourselves in a way. Right. Um, and so so I think you know for us and for for other liturgical churches, yeah, I mean the the uh, the service is fundamentally about the worship of God. Yeah, and uh, and we hope people come to it course because right. we want them to experience that I, it was a beautiful thought i was at a uh, catholic monastery just just mm-hmm. doing a retreat um that was about a year ago or so to a year or two ago and I, it really was a beautiful thing to me to and i attended the mass they, they they said please they had seven services i think they did all the offices during the day yeah. um and so they did all seven of them and they just said they said you don't have to come to all of them but please come to the mass though so i think that was the one that they asked people to come to and so I, I went I went to a couple of them, but I, I definitely went to the mass. And, I, and I, it did strike me as I walked into there, and there was, I don't know, I think it was five or six monks mm-hmm. um, that were that ha, that were had dedicated their lives there. And it did strike me that I was coming into something that was it wasn't like this service happened because I was there. Right. I was yeah. entering into something that was going to happen one regardless of whether I was there or not, but was. Yeah was just part of their rhythm yeah, and was just part of some, an ongoing prayer that God would impact the world. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not necessarily on board with like, I know there's, I've read some of the Catholic theologians I've read would say essentially the world would fall apart if the mass didn't happen. Right. And I'm not there. Sure. Sure. I don't think the mass is that important. Sure. I think that God would still hold the world together. Right. Uh, you know, it's like that whole thing. If, if you burnt every Bible, on the face of the earth, the word of God would not disappear. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. right. it's, yeah. it's about God. Yeah. But yeah, just that, but sure. that sense of entering into something that was an ongoing reality was. Mm-hmm. It just kind of it, it it just went. I went. Oh, this is. There's something to that. Yeah. And again, it's just the form, right? It's the it's that same repetition almost every day. Yeah. Um, every day, really, in that monastery for mm-hmm. since the early 1900s have been happening. Yeah. Um, and I and I love that the. The, the two in the, the two the the form of day in day out really the slog of getting to yeah. know God and developing a spiritual life yeah and and it's not it it's not the your level of prayer isn't contingent upon how you feel right it's not contingent upon what happens that day right and and but that was hard for me to learn mm-hmm. where I, I wonder if that comes more naturally to someone who who's been involved in a liturgical tradition more and, you know, one of the things that I experienced in, in the first, uh, you know, in my training years in seminary, mm-hmm. the first few times that I was kind of out on my own or I'd go to visit someone in hospital or at home and people would say to me, you know, oh, could you, could you pray with me? Like, uh, you know, I'd really love to have a prayer. And I'd, I'd kind of, you know, pause for a minute and be like, right. oh, you know what? I, I left my prayer book in the car, <laughs> right? Like there was this terror that came over me yes. that I'm like, oh, I can't pray without the prayer book. And so, yes. and so there's, I mean, you know, it, in a way it comes naturally to pray in that way, but there's, there's a kind of, there's a kind of thing you have to get over too, where you have to get to a point where you're, you're able to just pray extemporaneously yeah. and realize that it's like, 
the book is there as, as a great help and something right. we've inherited, but it's not. Well, and we have, I have, like, I, I have the opposite problem or have had the opposite problem where um, the, the, I feel almost the pressure to say something new each time. Right. right. You know, rather than, and, and I can't actually be formal. I can't have the same thing over right. and over again. And, and even in, in times where I've had, where I've prayed for a number of different people and there's almost a pressure to, oh, can you say something new to me? Right. right and, right. um, and so there's almost the, the flip side of that where yeah. you've got this beautiful form to pray through, yeah. but no, no, it needs to be new. It needs to be spontaneous. It can't be the same thing. Yeah. And, um, like I, I remember when I was, uh, really early on in my, in my, um, spiritual life, um, I, back, back when I still lived in California, um, I was, I, I had set out to read the Bible f- through, uh, from cover to cover, mm-hmm. Genesis to Revelation. And the, th- I, I, 10 chapters a day, whatever, every day I'd sit down and I'd read and I got through the whole thing and put it down. It was like, great. I conquered the Bible. Now I'm going to learn how to pray. I'm going to conquer prayer. Sure. So the next morning I, I resolved, I'm going to get up, I'm going to sit down and I'll pray. And so I did that. I, you know, got ready all for that. Got back uh, to where I was going to be. So I remember sitting down on the ground, closing my eyes and going, where's my Bible? <laughs> right, right. I mean, I lasted less than 30 seconds. Right. And yeah. I just picked up my Bible and went, I think I'll just read through the New Testament again. <laughs> right, I right. gave up, I totally gave up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because I had no, I hadn't, I didn't know what the form was or the format was sure, at all. Sure. I was waiting for something to happen. Yeah, right. And right. and because and it wasn't, I had never, I, I not and you know, I had good pastors. I'm not saying I have good pastors mm-hmm. or teachers that probably talked about prayer. Right. But I didn't hear it and I didn't listen. Right. There's a lot of things I didn't listen to when I was 25. <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So I, um, I, I just had no idea what to do. Yeah. And, and I think one of the, and now, you know, obviously I've learned a lot and, and I do have a, I have a, I do have a value for the spontaneity Mm -hmm. of following the spirit of God, but I learned a significant value for the form of following him that can be handed down through tradition. Sure. Sure. And, and I, and it seems to me had I been in a liturgical tradition growing mm-hmm. up, um, though I wasn't, it seems to me that if I had been at that point, you know, of course you're changing everything about my life now, but right. if I had been at that point, yeah. I would have at least had an idea of what prayer looked like. Right, right. In a petitionary yeah. sense, at the very least, of, yeah. of asking and speaking to God. Sure. And, um, you know, one of the things that we that we teach in from the charismatic perspective is... Prayer should be, uh, and maybe this is maybe this would be a critique of the liturgical mm-hmm. method. I don't I don't know that prayer should be about ninety percent listening and ten percent talking. Right. Yeah. Right. And yeah. and then and so then the maybe the the downside of if I had been in a liturgical tradition is then rather than trying to figure out a place of being before the Lord mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. listening, I would have gone okay. Now God, listen to me. Yeah. Right. Right. And I wonder. I don't know. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's neat that you bring that up about the you know what percentage of it is is listening and what percentage is prayer because it's I mean I think about pastoral work too right like um, y- you know how easy it is not to listen to people when you're talking yes, to them so people easy. I mean people just like will so willingly just reveal so much of what's on their heart that you need to pray for and what's going on in their lives and if you are not attuned to it. And sometimes oh, yeah. it's sometimes, you know, and I hate to, I hate to sort of talk about it in a way that makes it about me again or about <laughs> us, but it's like, you know, sometimes you do pray a prayer. I'll pray for someone and I'll kind of know, I'm just like, I wasn't listening closely enough and yeah. that fell flat. And I'm like, yeah. and, and part of it is not, it's not about me feeling bad about myself. I think it's more about me being like, God, I, I could have been, I could have done better for that yeah. person or I, yes. I could have listened yes. to you more, you know, absolutely, uh, and, and prayed more deeply. And so, so it is this, like, I think this, yeah, heavy balance or careful balance of, of prayer and, uh, and listening, speaking and listening. And well, listening and I think, and, and you, I, I'd imagine you'd corroborate this, that so much being in ministry mm. and, and carrying a, a burden to care for the heart of the father or to, yeah. to communicate the heart of the father to people so much about my preparation in terms of my daily life and my daily rhythm mm-hmm. with prayer, with study and all of that is to put me in a place where I can more effectively communicate him to others. Right. It's so, yeah. so much of prayer is that now. Yeah. 